All right, so thank you so much. Um, the topic of our presentation today is cost modeling analysis for heterogeneous integration of chiplets. Um, before I go into the, uh, the details of the presentation, I would like to acknowledge and thank my co-authors and co-contributors, Javi de la Cruz from ARM and Anurama Murthy from Microchip. And uh, this is not our day job, so the three of us got together as part of ODSA uh, in order to help um, facilitate and grow the ecosystem around chiplets. And what we'll be presenting here is essentially a close collaboration between the three of us under the ODSA Business Working Group umbrella. So what's the problem statement? What are we trying to do? Well, it's all about economics. Uh, if you have heard earlier in uh, one of the sessions today uh, from D-Matrix, one of the comments was, does it make financial sense? Should we do chiplets? Um, that is a big question that keeps coming up. And the purpose here is we know that heterogeneous integration is happening. It's the new reality. But how do we quantify the benefits and how do we take into account the trade-offs from an economic perspective, whether it's process or yield or known good die? Um, and then translate that into, you know, power performance and area downstream. So we looked around first and tried to see if there's any commercially available tools or software that could be used to be able to do a cost model analysis end-to-end -end and understand the trade-offs of doing chiplets versus monolithic or different types of chiplets. While there are a few commercial tools, they're not that versatile for what we wanted to do, and they don't allow a lot of customization. So that's essentially what led us down to this path. And as Rohit mentioned earlier in his talk, when we had a business working group workshop uh, last year, one of the top most voted items where people requested or they felt there's a need is this need for a cost model, a way to understand the trade-offs with and without chiplets. Um, what we're envisioning is essentially an economic model that can take inputs from whether it's foundries or OSATs or any of the you know, EDA vendors or even IP vendors feed that into this model and then provide a trade-off analysis that we can use across the industry. Remember, we're talking about open source and all of that. We are also hoping that this could become an open source type of a model. The model itself would be open source. The data doesn't necessarily have to be open, open source. So anyone can use their own data and they can understand the trade-offs by using this model. And we are hoping that everyone can participate in building this model and further enhancing it. So I think the motivation is fairly clear. Um, we did want to include in the model uh, details that are critical, right? Like the geometry, the material cost, test, known good die. Uh, Roberto made a very good presentation earlier today where he mentioned, you know, depending on which side of known good die you're on, you're either in a business or you're out of business. So it's very important to take into account known good die, assembly, test, sequence, geometry, everything, and then provide a trade-off analysis that could be useful. And of course, best if it can be open source and customizable. So one of the challenges with models is you can either make the models perfectly accurate but unusable, or you can make the models usable but extremely simplistic. So we have to strike that balance. Everyone who does these types of models knows this. So to strike that balance, what we've done is we've broken it into two phases. So first phase is a spreadsheet-based model that anyone can use. And we're already working on a more sophisticated Python-based model that would essentially allow even more sophistication in it. So the idea is if you want a rough first order back of the envelope calculation, you can do that. But the spreadsheet model goes a little bit more detailed and I'll walk you through some of the variables that are included in it. But then if you also want to do more uncertainty analysis and sensitivity analysis and all that, which you cannot do in a classical spreadsheet, we would have a Python script to also capture that. Um, some of the features of the model, it allows users to override inputs, so you could use the calculations or you could enter your own values. Um, it in allows integration of different process nodes, allows the die to be integrated with a silicon interposer, for example, as a passive interposer. Um, you could also integrate as many as 40 chiplets um, and compare this against a monolithic design, for instance. Yield of each process node is incorporated with two different models, uh, the Bose-Einstein model based on defect density as well as the Murphy model. Um, and of course, very important, we include the assembly sequence and KGD. How do you assemble things together? Which two pieces do you attach to what next piece? And then how do you mount them on the substrate? And then go all the way through the assembly sequence to see how that yield pans out. And then you could look at how those sequences can impact your results or where you need to insert test and look at the trade-offs of inserting the tests. So when we initially started out doing this, we thought, okay, we'll start with simple model and then we'll just basically have maybe five, six variables. But as we started talking to more and more people, this thing is not that easy. 
uh, when you're actually trying to make real life trade-offs, you can have a lot of variables that have to be incorporated. And the last count we had, we had about 24 of them. Um, and there may be a few more as well. Um, the way the model is set up is you have all of the inputs on one side, you know, from the wafer pricing and all the other variables. The output of the model is a graphical output, which can capture, you know, in a line chart or a pie chart, pairwise scenario comparison. So if you want to know, do I do monolithic versus chiplet? What's the delta? If I do two chiplets versus four versus six, you can essentially build this sheet and save them as different scenarios and compare them one against the other. We also output the total cost and also the impact on unit cost. One of the most important things that we also found is time is a very important variable. Your decision today on what you choose to do with chiplets or without chiplets would be very different if you made that same decision three, four, five years down the line. So it takes this whole data into the time domain and looks at what the impact might be over time when yields improve for a certain process node, for instance, or pricing changes or forecast changes. What does that do in terms of your benefits of one option versus the other. And then we also include a contribution percentage of each item. What's the impact of the bomb versus test cost versus KGD and what the trade-offs are for each of them. And for those who actually sell these devices to other end customers, we also include an option to have gross margins in percentages and dollars as well so you can understand how much this could impact your business. Now, I'm not going to go through a whole demo of the model. We are going to provide this open. It will be available on the ODSA website so you can read through it and learn about it and, and of course, contribute to it. But as a just test cases, we tried three different hypothetical scenarios. Um, in the first case, we basically took a simple flip chip die on a package and see what happens if we split it into half, two pieces. And what it shows is that there is obviously some benefit in terms of cost savings. The chiplet option is about 30% less expensive. We also did another test case where we had 16 chiplets and one big die, and we split the main big die into, into two. And again, what we find is that there is an advantage if you do chiplets. Again, this could become a disadvantage if you made any changes to any of those 24 variables. So by definition, this is a model. Any of the inputs can impact your, your output. And the third scenario that we analyzed was also when you have HBMs, uh, four HBMs mounted on a silicon interposer with a main die, and if you split that die, you can end up having some cost savings. So just to walk through very quickly um, the first scenario, so if you take a main die, you split it into two. Um, again, it's a 65 millimeter package that we assumed with a five nanometer silicon uh, process node, and then we can split that die into two pieces. The output looks something like this. So what you're seeing here is a graph that shows the unit price of a monolithic version versus the unit price of a chiplet version. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that the cost tends to go down slightly. Um, this is just one scenario in which we're incorporating the fact that there's a small reduction in, in wafer pricing over time. But imagine if you now added a reduction in you know, defect density, because as you improve the process, a silicon node matures, then the defect density changes and the yield improves. That can also impact these results. But this particular one, to make it simple, we're simply showing you the impact of just wafer price reduction. And clearly, there seems to be a benefit of doing uh, chiplets for this particular scenario. And the pie chart here shows essentially the contribution from each of those elements, whether it's the material or KGD or bomb you know, or, or test. And again, you can see that the biggest impact, as you would expect, is the material, is the bomb. Um, but then you have subsequent elements to it as well. So this is showing comparisons in the pie charts between option one and option two, monolithic versus chiplet. An important thing to notice here is that we've outlined what the cost drivers are. So you can also see these from the output of the model. And in this case, it shows that your biggest impact is, of course, material, but the second biggest is KGD. So you could use this to say, all right, maybe I need to do, if I want to get better improvement in my cost savings, maybe I need to spend a bit more time on KGD. And as Roberto mentioned, look at ways of either doing a different sequence or you know, including test or other kinds of th things that you may do to be able to reduce the KGD impact. Now, one of the things that you can notice is, right now this is just showing uh, unit volume, but what if we include the effect of shipment? And in this example, if you have, say, an annual shipment of 100K versus a million by year five, um, this graph basically shows you the benefit uh, of chiplets as you increase the shipment volume. So if you are a, an application where you're maybe you know, shipping or using only 100,000 units a year, the benefit of doing chiplets may not be worth the headache if you're down in that first year, you know, volume wise. But if you're doing like a million of these, then that difference becomes significant. So you got to take shipment volume into account with all the other variables, and that's what this model takes into account. 
Now, remember, all of these numbers that we've entered here are deterministic values, single point in time values. But last time I checked, anyone you talk to in marketing will tell you, yeah, of course, we're going to ship a million units by five years. But it could be 500,000. It could be 250K. It could be 6 million. Um, so we have to be able to incorporate uncertainty into the analysis. And what this does is we are building in the Python script a capability to incorporate uncertainty as well. As an example, we just pick one variable. The benefit of the model is that you can include uncertainty on all the variables and look at them combined to see what shakes out. But just as an example, when you look at silicon wafer defect density of the main monolithic die for this particular scenario, if your defect density was around 0 0.05, meaning it was really well performing, you may not gain that much by doing chiplets. On the other hand, if the defect density is really high, you may gain a lot by doing chiplets. So you can now ask yourself how much uncertainty are you willing to live with and what are your business parameters going to be around that defect density for that particular application. You can also run the model the other way and say, at what probability will chiplets become on par with monolithic? And in this case, as a hypothetical example, we say there's a 6% chance, given the uncertainty around defect density, you may end up being on par with, with chiplets. So again, you can incorporate other variables like IP cost or volumes and pricing and, and defect densities and yields to see what that space looks like and how much margin do you have to take that plunge into doing chiplets. And in some cases, it makes absolute sense. In others, it may not be that clear cut. And the benefit of the model is it can show you what that solution space looks like. Now, same thing we did with scenario two. So you can see when you're doing, you know, one chiplet case versus the other, it's a very similar uh, setup, but notice the cost drivers have shifted now. So in this particular scenario, it was material, not KGD, but NRE. And this is something that you can use for your decision making and say, wait a minute, if my NRE is so high, perhaps I could employ IP reuse, or maybe if I have a mask, I can use that same chip across multiple other product lines and lower my NRE costs, which are upfront. Again, it helps you prioritize and understand which part of the entire ecosystem you may need to play with in order to minimize the cost and improve the benefits of using chiplets. It's just a snapshot showing the kind of output that you may be able to get. Third scenario, again, with four HBMs mounted on an interposer with a die, we just split the middle die into half. And in this case, very similar types of output, but in this case, you're back to KGD. KGD becomes very important because you're doing an interposer and you have all these other factors. But notice the third variable, IP interface. In this case, you may find out that using a cheaper or a more open source, maybe an open HBI or a bunch of wires or other type of an IP interface might be able to lower your cost and might give you a better visibility and reduce that sensitivity to the uncertainty that you have to deal, deal with in the marketplace. So we are at the stage where we are opening up this model, you will see a link to it on the ODSA website. We encourage you to basically download the spreadsheet, play with it, share your inputs with us. And we are adding more and more variables into the model. We're going to add more vetting into the model. And we're taking more default values that we can find so that we can simplify certain aspects of the model. And you may find out that a lot of things may matter a lot to different people. But for a particular scenario, they may not be in the top 10 or the top 5. And then you're like, okay, maybe I can ignore those and focus on the ones that are the most important drivers for that particular application. What our vision is for phase two is that once we have a Python-based script, we are, which we're working on right now, we might eventually be able to incorporate this into something the EDA guys can use and part of CDX, for example, where we could provide this as a tool for decision-making when you're doing your layout and you're trying to understand what the trade-offs are um, uh, during the early stages of the design process. So last slide, call for action. Again, we'll be releasing this model periodically and we'll be making updates to it with version control. So you can always go in and, and essentially pick the latest version and play with it. And join us. You know, we're a band of three, but we're always open to more inputs and more, more support and value. So please, if you have any existing parameters or any addi additional things you would like us to incorporate, help us join and, 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 and improve the value of that model. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Often, the, when you go into chiplets, the package substrate uh, costs and complexities change. Did you include that in your? Yes. So the size of the substrate, the price of the substrate, that's included. The sequence of how you do the assembly with that substrate, it's included. 
Um, and yes, even the yield of the substrate is included, which is a very important factor when you go to very large body size substrates. I have a question. So uh, in, I mean, in, I don't know, at least in the two model scenarios you showed, uh, miscellaneous cost was one of them. What, what do you uh, kind of, uh, like, what would you uh, label as miscellaneous cost? Because you also had operational, you had a lot of, you know, detailed stuff. So Correct. So the way we've done it is um, miscellaneous costs can include things like you may have these little capacitors and small passive devices that you mount on a package and you're going to use them throughout. They're always going to be there. They're like a baseline cost adder, but they're not going to change with any of those scenarios. So you will always have, it's like a baseline additional cost you will include. So miscellaneous costs can be any of those things. You can incorporate them either as part of the bomb or you could include them as miscellaneous costs. There are also fine, smaller things like you may include certain testing equipment costs that you may need to add, which are again, peanut buttered over the entire project. You will still use them. Mm -hmm. So we give that opportunity for people to add things that may be something we may not have considered as part of the design, but they can add that and gets amortized over the entire length of the project. So any variety of possible costs could be included as part of miscellaneous. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a flexibility we've provided. Okay, but but seems like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Hi, Mudas. Uh, quick question. In your model inputs, you showed uh, 40 plus chiplets as part of uh, input. So the question is, if you look at the typical solution sets, what would be the number of chiplets which uh, are going to be part of a given solution? Uh, maybe there are extreme cases where you might have 40 chiplets, but do you have any idea in terms of a sweet spot of number of chiplets uh, which would constitute major volume? We, it's interesting you should ask that, DJ, because we asked the same question from the most logical people we could think of, which was the OSATs. And we said, well, what do you think is reasonable? And one of the examples, the scenario two, which has 16 chiplets with one main die, was actually provided by the OSATs. So I would say 16, 20 chiplets seems to be, nobody seems to raise their eyebrows, but we wanted the model to be versatile enough. I don't anticipate anybody doing 40 chiplets, but if they are, you know, they're welcome to. The model won't stop them from doing it at least. There may be other reasons why they can't do it, but not the model. Um, but I think somewhere around 16, 20 seems to be a fairly common number that's been thrown around. All right, cool. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>